Welcome to Chemistry at York. This is an open educational resource produced by a collaboration between the Department of Chemistry at York College and the Department of Natural Science at LaGuardia Community College of the City University of New York. This lecture is entitled Atomic Theory Number One, Introduction, Principles and Laws. My name is Emmanuel Chang, and today we're gonna to learn some chemistry. Hi, my name is Kelly, I like to cook and martial arts. Hi, my name is Vimal, and I like video games. Hi, my name is Tessa, and I like carbon reactions. Hi, my name is Simon, I like rock music. Um, hi, my name is Dayala Ibrahim, I like working out and also playing sports. This lecture is an introduction to atomic theory. The idea of an atom or a teeny tiny indivisible particle was developed initially in the ancient world and way back in the 500s BC. An Indian teacher named Akarya Kanad, teacher and philosopher, he initially developed the idea of a small, the smallest possible particle. Um, and it's said that he uh, developed these ideas by observing grains of rice. And he introduced the idea of anu, or atoms. A little bit later, independently, um, two Greek philosophers named Leucippus and Democritus um, developed an, an atomic theory that said all things are composed of atomos, or indivis indivisible particles. Following Leucippus and Democritus um, came Aristotle, the, <clears throat> perhaps the, uh, gr the most famous philosopher of the ancient world. Aristotle claimed that matter is comprised of four elements and their combination, fire, earth, air, and water, and that any material could be broken down into one or more of these elements. So these are all ideas that have some semblance to modern atomic theory. But unlike modern scientists, these philosophers did very little to test their ideas um, as we do now when we practice science. More than 2000 years after the Greeks, um, modern atomic theory was developed. In 1807, a scientist named John Dalton proposed five postulates um, about what came to be known as atomic theory. The first postulate is as follows. Matter is composed of exceedingly small particles called atoms. The word atom comes from atomos, the Greek word uh, that was uh, developed by Leucippus and Democritus. An atom is the smallest unit of an element that can participate in a chemical change. In other words, if we were to take a piece of copper, now copper is the material that makes up the exterior of these pennies. If we were to take a piece of copper and divide it and take that piece and divide it and take one of those pieces and divide them and just keep dividing them smaller and smaller and smaller, um, eventually we would might get a piece that looks something like this. And these spheres represent individual atoms. Now, if we were to take off one of these individual atoms and try to divide it, we could not divide it and still have a material called copper. So an atom would be the smallest unit of that element that could still be considered that element. The second postulate of atomic theory uh, says that an element consists of only one type of atom, which has a mass that is characteristic of that element and which is the same for all atoms of that element. So for copper, you have a piece of copper, all the atoms that make up that piece of copper are the same and they have uh, similarities that, or the similarity is in mass and the similarity is in many different characteristics as well. Today we know that this postulate isn't, isn't entirely true, which we'll see when we learn about isotopes. But at the time, um, Dalton's postulate was pretty close to being uh, correct. The third postulate of Dalton's atomic theory is that 
atoms of one element differ in properties from atoms of all other elements. So the postulate two said that all atoms of copper are the same. It doesn't matter where the copper comes from. It doesn't matter if it's copper from a pipe or copper from a penny. The atoms of copper are identical to one another as long as it's copper. Postulate three says that copper, the atoms that make up copper are different from the atoms that make up iron or from the atoms that make up oxygen. Postulate four says a compound consists of atoms of two or more elements combined in a small whole number ratio. So now we're talking about compounds. Compounds are more complex substances that are made up of two or more different types of atoms. In a given compound, the number of atoms of each element, each of its elements are always present in the same ratio. And the fifth postulate says atoms are neither created nor destroyed during a chemical change, but instead rearranged to yield a different type of matter. And so you may have, as you can see in this example here, in this bottle on the left, you have a lump of copper and a bottle with a stopper on it, so it's, um, <clears throat> so it's airtight, that's filled with oxygen. Now here's your copper represented by the brown uh, atoms, and here's your oxygen represented by the red atoms. On the left here, the copper is copper. It's an element. And the oxygen is oxygen. It's another element. Copper and oxygen, however, can react with each other. That is, they can undergo a chemical change. And in this chemical change, these atoms rearrange each other. So the brown lump and the red pairs of atoms combine and rearrange themselves to give you copper oxide, where now the brown copper atoms and the red oxygen atoms are interspersed among each other. And this is what we would call a compound. Based on these five postulates, and uh, as a side note, different textbooks and different lectures will differ on the exact number of postulates. Um, it's not so much a matter of uh, disagreement, but just a difference in the way they're organized. So don't be alarmed if your textbook says there are three or four uh, postulates of atomic theory. If you go through them, you'll find the same information in all of the postulates. So out of these postulates, there come several laws. One of them is called the law of conservation of matter. Now, what is a law? So we're not talking about the Constitution of the United States. We're not talking about that kind of law. We're talking about a natural law. And so a natural law <clears throat> arises when people make the same observation over and over and over. And every time you have a certain set of conditions, you get the same result, and that becomes known as a law. So the law of conservation of matter says that there is no change in total mass during a chemical reaction. The mass of the reactants equals the mass of the product. <clears throat> so in the previous slide, where we saw copper reacting with oxygen to form copper oxide, the mass of the copper plus the mass of the oxygen must equal, according to the law of conservation of matter, must equal the total mass of the copper oxide formed. So let's um, ask ourselves a question here. What principle or principles of Dalton's atomic theory does the law of conservation conservation of matter come from? Think about that for a minute. Did you come up with this one? Atoms are neither created nor destroyed during a chemical change, but instead rearranged to yield a different type or types of matter. Because the atoms, 
which are the building blocks of matter. And the atoms are what gives the matter, give the matter mass. Because those atoms are not created, not destroyed during a chemical change, but rearrange, then the mass, which is, again, comes from the atoms, before the reaction, before the chemical change, and after the chemical change, must be the same. So hydrogen and oxygen, two very common elements, react to form water. And so let's do a problem here. If we have hydrogen, and let's say we have two grams of hydrogen, and we have 16, 16 grams of oxygen. They're going to react to give us water. How many, how many grams of water are we going to get? Kelly, how about you? Thank you. All right. So if we have two grams of hydrogen and 16 grams of oxygen, and we follow the law of conservation of matter, we will know that we will end it up with 18 grams of water because the, the mass of the reactants must be the same as the mass of the products. Thank you. What do you guys think? Okay, so let's try another one. Instead of hydrogen and oxygen giving us water, Let's try another <clears throat> common reaction. So carbon dioxide, abbreviated CO2, <clears throat> plus water, that's going to give us glucose and oxygen. So if we start with 88 grams of carbon dioxide, and 36 grams of water that produces some glucose and 32 grams of oxygen. How much glucose are we going to get? Mm, Vimal, how about you? Okay. okay, so if we follow the same thing Kelly did, uh, we should be able to get 124 grams if we added 88 grams of CO2, 36 grams of water. Would that be okay? <clears throat> so, what do you, uh, what, what do the rest of you think about that? Um, I think that might be wrong, actually. Uh, how come? Because if you look at the left side, um, 88 grams plus 36 grams should balance out with the right side, which is 124 plus 32 grams. So this arithmetic here is right, right? 88 plus 36 equals 124. Yes, that's correct. So what's the problem? Um, the problem is we still have 32 grams of oxygen right it's there. 32. Okay, so yeah. the law of conservation of matter states that the reactants and the products have to have the same mass, but not one product, the sum of the two products. Yes. So <clears throat> this the glucose plus the oxygen must add to 124. Yes. Right. So let's, let's, let's 124 do that. Minus 32. So 124 minus 32. That's going to give us 92. 92. So here we're going to get 92 grams. A second law that arises from the postulates of atomic theory is called the law of definite proportions. And the law of definite proportions states that all samples of a pure compound contain the same elements in the same proportion by mass. So if you have a compound like the copper two oxide that we saw uh, a couple of slides ago, 
then all the copper two oxide has both copper and oxygen, but not just any amount of copper and oxygen. They have copper and oxygen um, present in the same proportion by mass or by the same in the same ratio. And so the law of definite proportions is also known as the law of constant composition because different samples of the same compound having the same components in the same ratio by mass means that they all have the same composition. They're all composed identically. So we have the law of constant composition. So here we have an example of the law of constant composition. We have a compound here called isooctane. At this point, it doesn't really matter what isooctane is, but it, <clears throat> but it is nice that isooctane is a really cool sounding word. Isooctane, ooh. So let's say we have three samples of isooctane, very creatively named sample A, sample B, and sample C. Sample A has 14.82 grams of carbon and 2.78 grams of hydrogen. Sample B has 22.33 and 4.19 grams. And sample C, 19.40 and 3.64 grams. Now these numbers look kind of random and they look all very different from one another. But if we take the ratio of carbon to hydrogen for each of the samples A, B, and C, we get here 14.82 over 2.78 and we get a ratio of 5.33 if we do the division. If we do the same division for carbon to hydrogen in sample B, we get the same ratio. And if we do the same thing for sample C, we get the same ratio for sample C. That shows us that even though the total amounts of carbon and hydrogen are different for these three samples, the ratios of carbon to hydrogen are the same. In other words, all samples of isooctane have the same or constant composition. So let's think about this. If two materials are made of the same elements in the same mass ratios, are they necessarily the same compound? Think about that. There's another law that arises um, called the law of multiple proportions. Now this one is a little tricky. The law of multiple proportions says that um, sometimes more than one compound can be made from the same two elements. Each one of those compounds follows the law of definite proportions. When you have two such compounds, the mass ratios of the different compounds themselves will occur in small whole number ratios. Now that's a lot of words. It's very difficult to uh, sort of express until you see an example. So for example, you could have two compounds that both contain chlorine and copper. You might have a brown solid that contains, has a ratio of 1.16 grams of chlorine for every one gram of copper. Then you have a different mm, compound con uh, composed of copper and chlorine. And that compound has a different ratio, it has a ratio of, of 0.558 grams of chlorine for every gram of copper. The brown solid follows the law of definite proportions. Any sample of that brown solid has a ratio of 1.116 to 1. The green solid also follows the law of definite proportions. Any of those green solids has a mass ratio of 0.558 to 1. The law of multiple proportions says if we take the ratio of this brown ratio to the ratio of the green ratio, right? So you're getting a ratio of ratios you're going to get a small whole number. In this case, you get 1.116 over one for the brown solid, 
and 0.558 over 1 for the green solid. You take this over this and you get 2 to 1. And what does this actually tell us? This tells us that there are two times as many chloride atoms per copper atom in the brown solid relative to the green solid. In other words, the brown solid in some sense has twice as much chlorine as the green solid does. So you have 1.116 for the brown, 0.558 for the green. Think about this. How does the law of multiple proportions derive from the principles of atomic theory? Maybe these questions that we haven't answered, um, some of you can answer, try to answer in the comments or the discussion portion um, down there. Okay, so let's finish this lecture by doing a simple exercise. Which of the following examples, which of these following pairs, would follow the law of multiple, multiple proportions? Now remember, the law of multiple proportions arises because there are, you have two compounds made up of the same elements, but the ratios of those elements are different. So here we have H2O, which is water, and H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide. In water, you have the ratio of one oxygen atom for two, every two hydrogen atoms. In H2O2, you have the ratio of two oxygen atoms for every, hydrogen, for every two hydrogen atoms. So here you have a ratio of one oxygen to two hydrogens. Here you have a ratio of two oxygens to two hydrogens. You have, you have two compounds, same elements, and different ratios. So this pair indeed follows the law of multiple proportions. What about this pair here? Well, remember for the law of multiple proportions, we need to have two pairs of compounds that have the same elements, but in different ratios. Here you have CO2, carbon dioxide, you have carbon and oxygen. On the right here, you have carbon, carbon and oxygen, but you also have hydrogen. So this pair don't have the exact same elements, and so it would not follow the law of multiple proportions. Same for this pair here. You have nitrogen and hydrogen, nitrogen and hydrogen, but this compound on the right also has oxygen. Now, finally, let's look at this pair over here. You have C2H2 and C6H6. So indeed, you have two compounds that are made up of the same elements, carbon and hydrogen. On the left, you have a ratio of two carbons to, to two hydrogens. On the right, you have a ratio of six carbons to six hydrogens. At first glance, it might appear that this pair does indeed follow the law of multiple proportions. But what happens when you divide two by two? You get a ratio of one. What happens when you divide six by six? You also get a ratio of one. And so, surprisingly, perhaps, these two compounds also do not follow the law of multiple proportions. Okay, so to recap what we learned in this lecture, first we looked at a brief history of atomic theory in the ancient world. Second, we learned the postulates of modern atomic theory. And third, we looked at three laws, the law of conser conservation of matter, the law of definite proportions, also known as constant composition, and the law of multiple proportions. Thank you all for watching this presentation of Chemistry at York.